and welcome to Shambles College. Please sit down or stand up. This, it's a very liberal college, both liberal arts and liberal science. And uh, Josie, would you like to take the register? Yes, I see you're all here. Brilliant. That took no time at all. Um, hello, welcome to the, by the way, first of all, sorry for yesterday when we were, we were meant to be having Mark Gatiss on. Uh, it was not our fault. It was, uh, I believe a British telecom error that meant that, uh, we have no service. So we weren't able to do that show. We will be doing the Q and a with Mark Gatiss next Monday. Uh, so now it's term time and today, hey. got, sorry, Josie. No, I missed it very much yesterday. I didn't realize it through my whole day of filter, not to, not to have our chat. It does. I think that extra bit of adrenaline that because you still get, even though it feels more relaxed than doing a gig, there is still just that little bit of, of an extra adrenaline that comes in. And I agree. I was all over the shop. Mm. Not having that again. Not having that again. Worst case, I'll just have the computer off and spend an hour talking to you in my head. Oh, I'll send you that drawing that I did of my head. That's <laughs> fine. And I'm making a blue tack version out of it as well. I've been, I've been watching, watching a Lionel Richie uh, <laughs> video, and that's helped me work on a lot of blue tack uh, versions of my own head. Um, the uh, I'll just say who we've got on today. We've got uh, David McCormick, who was on the uh, the second uh, show that we did, and David's going to be talking about an incredible show he did uh, about Heracles. I didn't even know Heracles, Hercules, and uh, mixing with the the music of um, Duke Ellington as well, and about creativity and art. And we also have Natalie Haynes, who was on in the second week. I'm pretty certain, uh, and that's going to be talking about the uh, classical world and various things there and uh and then i don't think we've got any music to end today as far as i know so that's what we're going to do josie do you want to open with your show and tell uh yes, yes. So, so it was my birthday on friday uh it was an unusual birthday my birthday party in the evening was very sparsely attended <laughs> by me and johnny and the baby and uh, no other guests <laughs> um, uh, uh, i i got given this book uh, How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell and it's quite a, um, a it was given to me by my friend Ellie as a sort of rebellion against uh, putting too much pressure on myself in these frightening times this is um, it's uh, described as an argument against the cult of efficiency and I felt both consoled and invigorated by it so I think it's a way to sort of reclaim yourself and your space and your headspace from the kind of relentless machine of the modern world so i'm excited it's yeah. weird isn't it that kind of work drive because i don't know where i get it from my, my eldest sister has it as well that that mo every moment that's wasted and i waste a lot of moments as well the the, the burden of guilt entirely pointless guilt when you can just be staring out the window or just uh, but it's like have i done enough today hang on how many things have i done i bet you that is ridiculous um the uh, My Show and Tell, is that sounds great, by the way, that book. I, I think I'm going to have to uh, get a copy of that. Um, I've got, you probably know about these, Josie. This is a wonderful series of books that were called Thinker's Library. Huh. And these were great books. Uh, as far as I, I think they were the Ethical Society that actually brought them out, or the Humanists. I, I'm forgetting which group it was. Um, but. <laughs> They were little books of uh, great work. So this, for instance, is Lectures and Essays by T.H. Uh, Huxley, uh, famously be, uh, known as uh, Darwin's uh, Bulldog as well. And uh, there were books of astronomy, uh, books of philosophy, and they were made to be available for everyone. So this was this idea that, you know, it previously all of the great works, the important works, they, they were available if you were the kind of person who, you know, mainly collected bugs and went out on your horse and had a large library uh, in next your conservatory whereas this the, these were and what they were particularly for as well amongst other things this is the book i was telling you about which i think you'd be envious of was things like this this uh do miners read dickens this is a beautiful book that i got from uh jeff towns um and this is all about uh the south wales miners library and all of the libraries that were built up uh again this kind of the the thirst for knowledge Wow, and it's incredible! And uh, this is a beautiful history of them. And these books were very much kind of part of things like a lot of the communal libraries that were just set up. They would fund them themselves, and so that people could then, when they would then go in and argue as well, you know, the, the view of the universe became so much bigger. And when you work, I mean, and you see it. I mean, as you know, with some of the the. Um, Oh, man, I've forgotten his name now. The Glaswegian Union leader that I told you about the Kenneth Williams story. Uh, my my friend and yours. Um, Jimmy Reed. 
Yeah, Jimmy Reed. When you watch someone like Jimmy Reed uh, talking on on a chat show, or when you see some of the people who made it in the House of Lords for just the points of reference as well, the the yeah. breadth of knowledge. Yeah, and and absolutely, like I really love that fact that they could be stereotyped as very like uh, like macho blokey men, or, or or sort of men who do this rough work and at the same time it's having full um full access to this library of beauty and gentleness and softness and ability to kind of deploy it in a very like yeah oh man what a man I was thinking of um of John McLean this morning because I was recording my friend voice messages of me singing um a folk song by Alistair Hewlett uh, called Don't Sign Up For War that uh, betray your country, serve your class, don't sign up for war. <laughs> That's what I do on a Tuesday morning. And, <laughs> yes, you, I have to admit, of all my friends, you are the one who most habitually doesn't sign up for war on a Tuesday. I will not. No, I will you refuse. just refuse. A bayonet, that's a weapon with a working man at either end. <laughs> that's what I say. <laughs> The um, because you know the, the the famous story Jimmy Reed was um when, when Kenneth Williams was once oh. on the Parkinson's yeah, Parkinson yeah. Parkinson with uh um it was I think it was Maggie Smith and John Betjeman and and he was going on about you know the working man just people you know happy with your job and all this kind of stuff and and at one point Michael Parkinson goes Kenneth can I just tell you I think you're talking crap mm -hmm. and there's this shock and I, and uh, I have never been so insane. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> have you have you seen that that wonderful uh it, it's a beautiful thing and um. And then he invited, he, he said, Kenneth, come back on. And I'm going to uh, invite Jimmy Reed on as well. And uh, sadly, the, uh, you can still see that episode. But what you can't see is the sound check where apparently Kenneth Williams, uh, very, very, he, I think it was Yeats. I can't remember which poet. He recited a poet and uh, he, he was kind of doing it just to go, oh, I've got, I've got the cut of you, Jimmy Reed. And, uh, and then when he got to the end, uh, Kenneth Williams just looked at him. And Jimmy Reed went, that was WB Yates, wasn't it? And Kenneth Williams went, yes. And then <laughs> he recited, Jimmy Reed, Jimmy Reed uh, recited a poem. And he turned to Kenneth Williams and he goes, do you know who wrote that? And Kenneth Williams went, no. And he went, I did. And it was like, that. from that point onwards, Kenneth Williams knew he was possibly going to lose that particular argument. And also I love, so I, 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 I'm not somebody to, somebody to sort of hanker after times past that I don't understand but at the same time to have a discourse where they're like I know we'll invite on this socialist <laughs> union leader so that he can quote poetry I'm like that's the discourse I want now I don't want we'll invite on uh Lawrence Fox so that he can get angry about nothing like about his his privileged circumstances you know I want somebody who's gonna yeah yeah, but it would change now because you'd still, you know, if you did have, have things, things like, you know, some of the great, uh, you know, we're joined by uh, the chair for the public understanding of philosophy, uh, Angie Hobbs. Angie, I believe you do an impersonation of Robert De Niro, you yeah. know, so that would kind of go awry, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, we will into uh, Natalie is here as well. We're going to quickly talk to to David first, because before we get on to uh, art and Heracles and all things, um, I know that you were uh, yeah, an enormous, uh, an enormous admirer, admirer of, of Prince, and this is uh, the fourth anniversary of, of of his death. And I just, I was listening to "Sometimes It Snows in April" this morning, which I think was the first song that I really remember getting. You know, it kind of did something to me there. Um, what was it? What is the, what what is the, the the joy and the delight of 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 Prince for you? Um, the joy and delight of Prince for me. I mean, I um, I introduce "Sometimes It Snows in April" when I do it as that um, uh, tra album track that seals the deal, that um, demonstrates your credibility, you, you can impress your date. Because so often I've played Sometimes It Snows in April and people have said, oh my God, this is amazing, who is this? And then you say Prince, they're like, no way. And amazingly, some, some of them sometimes have the record. Well, haven't you got Parade? Yes, well, this is on Parade. But, um, my introduction to Prince was visual. And at the time I was a born again Christian. And so he was very forbidden. Because uh, when I first saw a picture of Prince, I was in Guyana. And um, in Guyana, um, 
families abroad sent home magazines. So we used to get um, um, magazines about American music. And so I saw this guy, this, um, I didn't know what he was um, in terms of his um, origins. Um, he was small. He had a kind of a nasty mustache and kind of um, straightened the hair. And he was wearing a trench coat and black bikini bottoms and boots. And that was it. And he was sprouting from his bikini. And I, 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 there was, uh, I, don't, I just kept seeing these pictures of this guy. And then one afternoon I was at home um, on my own. Um, I remember very vividly I was sitting on the floor. I was darning a sock because in those days I did. And then this sound just came on the radio. And it was the sound of a cassette that had been left in the sun with a Hammond on it. So he's like, rawr, 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 rawr. and then his voice comes in. It's like, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get to this thing called life. And I was like, WTF is this? He pinned <laughs> me to the wall. And then Let's Go Crazy unfolded. And then at the end of Let's Go Crazy, they said, and that was Prince. And from that day, I was like, oh my God, so that's what he sounds like. And I was absolutely hooked. I got back to the UK in 1987. I got my first supplementary benefit check. I went straight to our price and I bought Around the World in the Day, Parade, Purple Rain and uh, Sign of the Times. Wow. And for me, um, he, he just let me know that um, it was OK for me to be a little bit different to other people. Um, and I, I, uh, I, I always say he, he got me through high school. Um, and um, he was a bit of a... God, really. Because you see, when I think about 2016, I think about 2016 being um, almost mythological because um, ba Bowie dies and becomes an asterism. I'm not really aware of that happening much, um, you know, after antiquity. You know, Bowie is now a constellation in the sky. It was arranged by these Belgian astronomers, but there he, there he is, the Al Aladdin saying. They found a cons uh, an asterism that matched it. And, Called it, called, called, called it Bowie. And then um, George Michael died. And George Michael died at Christmas. And then Prince died in April. And the sky um, where I was went purple. <laughs> and suddenly it was, um, so I, 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 I've been, I, I really pin what's happened since um, 2016 to um, those incidents and people um, often laugh it off, but actually I'm like, no, there was something really um, shifting seismically to that extent, because not only was it um, fatal or fateful, it was also practically biblical because um, we were, it, it felt like you were living in a, in, in a time of prophecy in which George Michael, Prince and David Bowie, four of our biggest um, symbols of Western symbiosis, prophesied their prophesied their futures. There's a star man waiting in the sky. Sometimes it snows in April. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. Mm. That, that that was 2016. So like so, ever since then, I've been calling the years and everything that happens within them uh, the, the post 2016s or symptomatic of the post 2016s. Man, that's such a beautiful. Uh, piece of mythology to that's uh it's i mean the prince thing that something that i find fascinating is i, I was taught, i don't know if you know susan rogers oh, sorry the thing i left out prince um was found in in an elevator so in let's go crazy it's um don't don't let the elevator bring you down oh no let's go crazy he was found in an elevator in april but this is partly a problem with being a fic writer is that the more you write, the more chances that whatever happens to you, you will have written something that people can go, you see? And you'll be like, no! That's why, as a writer, you should only write, I'm going to live a wonderful life, and I'm going to, <laughs> and I'm going to have a great time lying by the pool. Or even lying by the pool, because then if you die lying by the pool, that's it, isn't it? Are, isn't you, it? are you debunking me? <laughs> <laughs> see, I, th I think there's something very important about that as well, though.
So I think the thing, that idea of being able to create our own myths, mm -hmm. not not to create something which then, I always think the problem with a lot of, uh, one, once we find these patterns, it's it's beautiful to create our own meaning with it. The worry is if you then set up your own church and insist everyone else obeys your meaning. You know, So I, I think it's very, <laughs> that bit of going, we're pattern seeking creatures. Sometimes we can make our own mythology and we go, do you know what? This, this, this brings me some comfort or this creates a narrative for me. And this is a person. And I think that personal relationship is quite an important thing to create sometimes. But I think um, uh, those circumstances also, um, they explained um, the past to me. They explained why there are constellations of um, Orion, why, why there's a constellation, the constellation of Orion. Of Orion. Um, how it how, how it is that a personality or a um, uh, myth can move amongst people and so stir them to actually um, name constellations and yes. to create myths and legends, you know. And lo, it came to pass that he that that, that, that he wrote. Sometimes it snows in April and purple rain, and um, let's go crazy. And lo, he did. Um, you know, he became deceased within an elevator, blah, 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 blah. But I completely blah, blah. agree. And I also think that there's not enough in the modern world to treat the modern and contemporary as sacred and mythological and important. And people aren't given... Mm. Uh, it reminds me a bit, this is a bit of um, an obscure connection, but there's a painter I really like called George, come on, brain, stupid brain. Um, George, ah, come on. Um, uh, he, he paints um, landscapes. Uh, in 1970s council estates, that particular aesthetic of sort of those houses, and the way he does it is he um, he painted ones that were like a like a holy um, icon series, uh, and ones that kind of have in them religious iconography as well. And it's about taking things that are around us. At, uh, George Hill, let me check. I think it's not George Hill. Oh, I'm so frustrated at my stupid brain. Um, oh. Uh, but well, it doesn't matter. The name doesn't matter. The idea is... Uh... Sure. Yes, thank you, George Shaw. He, um, uh, yeah, and, and this idea that you are actually allowed to treat this circumstance now as if it is on a par with living in classical Greece or something. You are allowed to kind of um, imbue your world with that same gravity, even if your world is the modern world and, yeah. That's and that's, we should, really, we should. That, that's really interesting as well because um, oh, well. Um, when I was a lot younger and I was I, I, I was dreaming about becoming a singer and a songwriter, I was fascinated by the lyrics he came up with, and I couldn't understand um, a lot of them because I hadn't lived, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, things he, he'd write something like "closing time, ugly lights," and I'm like, "What does he mean by that?" And then I'd find myself a few years later in a bar attempting to pull. And then the lights would come. I was like, you know, oh my god, I look so ugly. <laughs> oh, that's what he means. <laughs> and then um, uh, he also, um, particularly on sign, like a, sign, sign of the times, um, demonstrated a real penchant for working class poetry. And then you think about where he comes from. He comes from Minneapolis. Who else comes from Minneapolis? Bob Dylan. So, you know, um, it's um, because he was so funky and quite different, he wasn't really seen as his working class poet, but that's what he was. And he seems to have come from the place where, you know, um, near to the, well, the, 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 the Can Can Canada Shield, some of the oldest rocks in the world, mm. where that same spirit seems to be very much part of that Caribbean, of, of that, Caribbean, of that Canadian um, musical mystique as well. See, I think that's it. Natalie. I'll, I'll bring you in here, which is that that as someone has who written, has written a great has, deal, has written a great uh, deal about the, uh, about the in fact you're currently recording so you stand up for the classics now in your front room, as opposed to uh, with an it's audience. It's not even in my front room, Robin. It's in my cupboard. You know where my hall <laughs> cupboard is, where the washing oh, yeah. machine is. <laughs> where your sleeping bag lives it's there. <laughs> <laughs> but this is having written about and and connecting the classical world with the modern world as, as someone who spent so long studying that how much do you think that does uh enliven and enlighten your kind of perception of 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 the modern world you know to, to to spend that time with the classical world and then then going well actually what are we seeing now in the modern world which with a certain amount of distance starts to become mythic starts to become you know these ideas which which we see as so distant from us 
Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And a long time ago, and I mean a very long time ago, literally half my okay. life, ago, um, I very briefly had a teaching job. And I used to teach with an incredibly brilliant man um, who, whenever anyone kind of began to question the relevance of Latin or Greek, in both of which he was so spectacularly fluent, he could compose, by the way. So you would occasionally get a note in your pigeonhole written in ancient Greek, perfectly constructed by him that morning. Um, people would sometimes ask about, you know, whether it was important to do Latin or to do Greek or classical civilization or ancient history and he would always give the same answer which is that the house of western thought has many rooms but only one basement and it still seems to me like the most brilliant answer although i understand that the you know idea of western thought is problematic of course because west of what east of what where's the where's normal to be west of and i i allow all those caveats i think there is still something incredibly important to um acknowledge about the fact that People who study classics get to study an entire civilization, multiple entire civilizations. So you don't just study literature or archaeology or art or yeah, philosophy or religion. Or you can do everything all in one kind of world. And that's an incredible thing to be able to do. And so, yeah, I find myself doing it all the time. To I'm completely on board with it being um, the anniversary of Prince today. But to me, it's also the anniversary of Rome today. Rome's 2,773 years old today. Happy birthday, Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I love Prince less because Rome is part of my um, <coughs> April 21st celebrations. I think all of it seems, it seems to me entirely appropriate that Prince should be linked in my mind with the beauty and majesty and bonkersness of Rome. He belongs there too. What marks, what marks the birth of Rome? Oh, the, the traditional foundational date um, when Romulus and Remus do their um, thing and get, um, uh, and then, and that, I'm not sure really how much, do, but yes, uh, one, one, one of those brothers at war narratives and Rome is found obviously by Romulus, otherwise it would be called Reem. Um, um, <laughs> there's a whole lot of really troubling now I've said it out loud, I wish I hadn't. Um, and uh, so, yes, that's the mythical foundational date of Rome is, oh, I could do this backwards. Is it 741 BC? I think so. Um, so, yes. Well, I'm interested it because there's something else, which is, which is, is there, a, is there a problem? This might seem like a very trite question. Is there a problem where sometimes we see, whether it's looking at history, whether it's going, you know, looking at the, at the classical times, whatever, where when it is studied as the past, it is a study of the past not of also human behavior of lessons to be learned in the same way with science when science becomes disconnected from also the world in which we live is are we seeing a change in the way that uh people are connecting to it or do we still see because I, I sometimes go to history lectures and i think this is all just like oh these are things that happened at no set you know the, the lack of a sense of connection and a sense of lessons to be learned for the current time is is i don't know if that's trite thing to ask or not i don't know if i think um i mean in a way i suppose there's a valid question to be asked of what history is for and it, it doesn't exist to be our um teacher you know if we choose to learn things from it that's up to us i guess but i think history i mean it's, it's a little bit difficult i guess to suggest that fact facts <laughs> about the past especially about the ancient past where you know we know so little in a way that modern historians just cry when you tell them what we consider to be evidence in ancient history. When you say, oh yeah, we found this, you know, stitched in back reference, to, and they're like, hmm, what now? And, but if there's, not, if there's not literacy, if there's not documentation, if documentation is destroyed, classicists get like, properly start to cry with joy when a papyrus is found. That's how it will like, one papyrus, we can't believe our luck. Or, you know, the incredible tablets at Vindolanda. I mean, this is like, this was a day when classes had bunting when they found the tablets at Vindolanda. And these are tiny postcard sized pieces of, of um, wood on which are scratched, you know, maybe 10 words sometimes. We're like, oh my God, this is incredible. So our idea of what counts as, as evidence is a lot more broad, I suppose, than, and you have to worry a lot less about in a different way, I suppose, about vested interests. If I were asking somebody about the Second World War, I would want to know what their motivation was. I would want to know what their current politics were to see how they were interpreting politics within sort of human memory, because they would definitely have 
they would definitely have an interest, even if it's a, to my mind, benevolent interest, they would have that. Whereas with the ancient world, it's quite hard to say, you know, that, you know, you're not going to find people who are really pro Nero or really pro, but you are going to find people who are really pro Christian. So you need to read those kinds of stories of how Christianity is persecuted under um, the Romans are a really good good case in point. More Christians have been killed by persecution almost certainly in the last 50 years than in the entirety of the Roman Empire. Um, and and that, that's worth bearing. Obviously, there are an awful lot more humans now. <laughs> there are a lot more Christians now. So partly it's just a numbers game. But the idea of the Romans as sort of vicious persecutors of Christians comes from the fact that history is written by the victors. And although it looks like Rome is the victor because they're a mighty military force, obviously Christianity won because here they still are. And as you'll see, no Emperor Brian Blessed, although I know he's your favourite. Now, this is, uh, and, and, and notice I'm not being daytime, otherwise I've gone into the impression, but I, I'm kind of fascinated, fascinated by uh, something we were talking about the other day, which was those who write the myths, those who write the stories. And so I was talking about this with David yesterday as well, which is you were telling me, for instance, about Pandora, the story of Pandora and how Pandora. can you can you give me a bit of a set again of, of how her story becomes something, not just her story, but it gets used to create a certain template. I can. Um, the excellent reason that I've literally written a book on this, <laughs> which, will be, which will be out in October if everything gets back to normal, um, oh, called no. Pandora's Jar. And um, it's called Pandora's Jar because Pandora doesn't have a box. Um, and Pandora doesn't have a box um, and she is given one by Erasmus. Right. So in the ancient world, if you look at any visual representation of Pandora, she doesn't have a receptacle of any kind. She's being created by the gods. Um, people almost always translate her name now as in the title of the um, Zom Zombie Never Let Me Go novel. Uh, what's it called? The Girl with All the Gifts. Girl with All the Gifts, yes. They always translate her passively, someone to whom gifts are given. But actually in Greek, Pandora means all giving. She's active, not passive. And just at this really basic level, this is what happens to women through stories through history over and over again. They're erased or reduced or diminished in some way. So all giving Pandora is also given many gifts by all the gods because she's created and Zeus has her created as a kalon kakon, a good bad thing um, in order to um, exact a price from humans because Prometheus has stolen fire and given it to us. Now fire obviously a good thing because henceforth cooking, wonderful news, um, but the price has to be paid and the price that has to be paid is is Pandora. And almost always Pandora is translated, that bit of Hesiod is translated as Kalon Kakon, as beautiful evil. But the two words in, in Greek, they're, they're, they're value laden in, in multiple senses, in visual or moral or just, um, or just descriptive without moral judgment. So you could just as easily use the phrase Kalon, beautiful, to mean good. You could just as easily take the word kakon, evil, to mean ugly, right? So she is a beautiful evil. She is also an ugly good, but it's never translated that way because it's much more plausible, isn't it? That as a beautiful woman, as a woman created by the gods, she must be pretty and therefore evil. And do you know why? Because Christianity happens and Eve happens. And so um, in some versions of Pandora's story, she doesn't have any receptacle at all. As I say, when you look at visual images of her in the ancient world, she is never shown with anything. In some versions of her story, she's given to a man named Epimetheus as his uh, bride. Um, Epimetheus is the brother of Prometheus. Prometheus means foresight. Yeah. Epimetheus means hindsight. He's the dumb one, right? And Prometheus <laughs> has given him this warning and says, if Zeus sends you a, a present, don't accept it don't accept it. And he goes, yes, I definitely won't do that. And then 20 minutes later, Hermes turns up with uh, Pandora and he says, here's your new wife. And he goes, tremendous, come on in. Go, oh. <laughs> and then, in some versions of the story, she acquires a jar, but we're never told where from. It's certainly given to her, if it is at all, by Hermes, because he's the one who escorts her. He is the psychopomp, the um, transporter of souls. Um, and uh, so it's come from either Zeus or from Hermes. And Sometimes the jar has good things in it. Sometimes it has bad things in it. Sometimes she opens it. Sometimes it becomes open. Sometimes her husband opens it. And by the time Christianity is done with her, she malevolently opens a box full of <laughs> terrible things. In the world. And you can trace all of this version back to Erasmus, of all people, because he translates the story. 
Um, and he translates the Greek word pithos, which means jar. And you know what a Greek jar looks like. They're tiny at the base. And then they're really, they're really easy to knock over, is what I'm saying as a clumsy person. <laughs> and he takes that word and he translates it as um, pixis, which means box. And within literally about 30 years of Erasmus's translation, you start seeing paintings where Pandora has got this huge strong box with like straps over it. And you're like, wait, how did this go from being like a casual, <laughs> someone might have knocked over the jar to malevolent woman. And you even get titles of paintings, Eva Prima Pandora. The two are combined so that Pandora can be held responsible for the Greeks, for the ancient Greeks. Um, Pandora is important for really one thing overall and that's that she is our ancestor mine and Joseph's. women all descend from pandora because there aren't women before her you guys descend from eric thonius in um athenian uh myth and so you know we're literally different then, to the greeks we're literally different species they made they made, they made, they made up an adam and eve uh trope to damn all classical women as well they just what they do is map Adam and Eve onto Pandora, I would suggest, because Pandora, the Pandora narrative dates back to probably the 7th, maybe even the 8th century BCE. Um, and the idea of a woman being responsible for the downfall of man, it's just not in Greek myth. It's not in Greek They sort of just shot that into it. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. Different. They just map it on top. It's so strange and until you, you know, remember the basic rule of this sort of thing, which is how can it be a girl's fault? Yeah, oh, oh, oh. But Pandora is this incredible figure who, um, you know, she she heralds change. She heralds change when Zeus lets us have fire, albeit against his best judgment. When Prometheus steals fire from the gods and we get it, that means an end to sort of the innocent time of wandering around, living an innocent rural idle life because we'll have to start making things and cooking things and innocence is gone well sure innocence is gone do you know what else is here bread i'm <laughs> <tired>. <laughs> i'll swap for carbs what <laughs> very disappointed in erasmus because you only really, really hear about all the good stuff he did was setting up international study programs and yeah, that well, now, <laughs> i'm saying he's had quite a kicking i haven't i've been quite nice i've been absolutely vile about robert graves and nathaniel hall i've been relatively <laughs> measured about erasmus relatively by my standard I'm, i must ask david uh, sorry sorry i was just thinking about that while i was talking i was just interrupting my own brain with the foundational date of rome i'm going with 753 bce i'm honestly guessing greek's better for me but yeah let's go 753 i don't know the um i was going to bring david because uh the last almost almost what well, one of the last live events that i saw before isolation began was david doing this uh incredible piece uh taking us through the the story of heracles uh but also fusing it with uh the music of duke ellington and uh which was one of the why most why didn't you take me um, i would love this I was, I was worried right out. whether what you would, would start heckling and I knew this was David's first <laughs> outing with Heracles and if you turned up in the front row he'd think hang on a minute if she keeps putting yeah. her hand up and going I think you'll find you've been reading the wrong <laughs> translation <laughs> Show us your was yeah, about but it was it was such an it was a very interesting and, and it, it was done as part of the Architectural Institute Monday lecture series and it was very different I think to all the other lectures they'd had but I David I was wondering when you were putting together that story when you were were first of all what attracted you to because i didn't even know as a few other people in the audience who the say heracles is hercules I, i've always known him as hercules not as heracles that story though what was it that, that attracted you to that to turn it into into that particular piece well um the excuse i used i came up with a term i googled it and i don't think anybody else has used it but i called it pinupism hmm because uh, basically, I'm gay, get gay. So I, um, you know, not all, this, is, this is not true of all gay men, but it is true of me. I like the be muscled male. So um, one of the things that that's happened um, in the years that I've been going to well, art galleries and museums is that there's always this statuesque be muscled male um, with a beard, um, which I also like, <laughs> called Hercules. So for a long time, I've just been like, you know, um, you know, collecting images of, of, of Hercules. And then um, uh, when um, my uh, boss at the TEO, at the Architectural Association, got in touch and said, we're doing the public lecture series. Um, it's politics, performance and protest. Um, you can do anything you want. And I thought, OK, let's really think about this. What is it that I haven't done yet? And I thought, I haven't done Hercules yet. And whilst I was studying art history, my, um, I, I, I did think, 
I did wonder, I don't know if you've ever seen one, why isn't there a Hercules pictorial? Why isn't there a big book of images of all of the Hercules? Because there are dozens of them all over the place, in America, in Europe. They've even, they've even got a um, <clears throat> Hercules um, on an Iranian mountain, this huge reclining Hercules um, that they synonymize with a, a Persian god whose name I can't remember. But um, yeah, uh, he's very popular. And um, so I started thinking about doing um, that, but I wanted it to be cheeky. So I thought about cha-cha-cha, but I couldn't find any decent cha-cha-cha composition. But at the time, um, I was, um, it was Christmas time, and I was thinking, I um, uh, wonder if Duke Ellington has ever done any decent Christmas music. So I Googled Duke Ellington Christmas, and I got the Nutcracker Suite. And his version of um, Sugar Plum, uh, the, the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, which he called Sweet Rum Cherry, mm. is um, really um, like a, a, a saucy burlesque. And I thought, oh, this could be interesting. How about we splice the music of Hercules to Duke Ellington? And um, I started asking my friends about it, and that was really striking, was that um, many of them didn't know that Heracles and um, Hercules were the same person. Um, one person said, which one is Heracles? Is he the one who got shot in the heel? And I thought, wow, so I'm not alone. An awful lot of people have no idea why there's this big log in these museums, like, you know, beating the crap out of some poor Hydra or something. <laughs> you know, they just like say, oh, that's Hercules. And then um, I realized that the films, the films are really criminal in that they don't tell the story at all. They just look for somebody who has the right body first. Mm. Like, you know, do you look like Hercules? Fine, you can play the role. And then they just um, um, confront him with a lion. And then he's, and, and, and th then the Hercules will say, it is the Nemean lion and kill it. You have no idea what, what, what's Nemean about this lion. So I wanted to get to the bottom of all that <laughs> stuff. So I picked out, um, I, I, I selected the um, uh, Duke Ellington cuts and thought, okay, um, 45 minutes of music, so you've got to tell the story in 45 minutes. And um, I selected the myths that um, I, 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 I guess I thought they'd be challenging, but um, there was one piece uh, by Duke called um, Skin Deep, which features um, a drummer called Louis Belson hammering the drums, and it just sounded like pure fury. And one of the things that struck me about the story um, and I thought I found really interesting was um, that Hera is a traumatized woman, is, is, is a traumatized is a traumatized goddess. She's raped. Um, Athena sneaks Hercules um, up to her breast while she's sleeping, and he savages her breast, and the Milky Way gets created. And Zeus is, um, you know, on the um, she 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 never seems to leave. Um, Mount Olympus, but Zeus is running around her domain because he's the god of the firmament, so he can he he has limited power on Earth. But she's doing that. But he's running around impersonating a rooster, impersonating a snake, impersonating a shower of coins, impersonating all kinds of things, and playing away and having children. And so when Hercules is Heracles is born, it's the last straw, and um, she goes insane and goes after Heracles, and in an attempt to pacify her. They call um, Herak, um, Her 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 but, but what 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 what? Uh, Alcides is his, is his original name, but he becomes Heracles, the glory of Hera, because they're trying to pacify Hera. So um, with 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 Skin Deep, the prologue was I became the fury of Hera, because I, I I really wanted that voice to open things like this is what has been done to me, you know, because um, so often and I think this chimes with what um. Uh, you were saying um, earlier is that um, uh, the uh, script is there's just this awful woman persecuting this poor guy but then um, you never find out what happened to this woman yeah and um, I just kind of took it from there
It's a wonderful, it's a really, I mean, it's, I know yeah, it's going to be, hopefully I think at the Larn weekend, which has been postponed um, yeah. and with luck is going to be in, in October. It's a, it's a really great piece of work. We're going to have to quickly, so we don't run out of time. We've had some questions in. Oh, sorry, Josie. Yes. So we should say that, that we, we do have a tip jar for the shows. And um, if you're watching and you can pop a little bit of money in the tip jar, it, we share it out between uh, all the different performers and between lots of other uh, performers but also we, we're popping money to art centres um, which are already um, kind of struggling for money as it stands but which uh, within their communities provide so much more than just shows and are, are really kind of community hubs as well and we want to help try and keep them running uh, because of these difficult and unusual circumstances. <laughs> So, yeah. I, I was going to mention that the not an art centre but uh, an art gallery, the Holborn, which is a lovely uh, art gallery in Bath, uh, which uh, when oh. it was clo when it closed down was Gr Grace and Perry exhibition, which I didn't oh, get a chance to see. Well, that that's struggling at the moment, and there, so so do also check out you know, check in your local tour. community as well. Sorry, I went there when I was on tour to see that Grace and Perry exhibition. Oh, and that's so when I was in the toilet afterwards, afterwards and <laughs> two middle aged ladies came in, and one of them said, "Oh, uh, listen, I'm not." I don't regret coming, but I wouldn't want any of those in my house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank goodness there's a financial imperative that will almost yeah. certainly preclude that. <laughs> 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 It's, yeah, it's a great game. Look around, check in your local area. If, if you are able to in any way help, there's a lot of different places which at the moment are trying to make sure uh, that they can stay open for for, for when this comes to an end. Um, this is uh, from Chris. This is from the live feed. We've had a few questions. Um, now, this is an interesting one, Natalie. This is about Julian Jaynes. And in fact, I've been reading quite a lot of Julian Jaynes. We've been reading Paul Brock's last book, which is absolutely fantastic. Julian Jaynes, for those who don't know, uh, believed that uh, until I think it was uh, the second century BCE, I think I'm right. So it was uh, that human beings didn't realise that the uh, internal monologue in their head was was them. They believed it was some kind of god or outside agency. Oh uh, yeah, okay. James's version. Julian James believes that the early work of Homer demonstrates that human beings did not have a sense of their own personal inner monologue, and the later work of Homer suggests that at that point we have had some neural development, some psychological development that means we go, oh, hang on a minute, it's me thinking these things. It's not God. So. Chris's question really is, do you get a sense of a change in perhaps almost the mental state of human beings from looking at things like early Homer and then later Homer? Um, I genuinely wouldn't feel confident and I would be surprised if many people would feel confident saying which bits of Homer objectively are early and which bits are late. Um, because the version of um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which we have, almost certainly are by two different poets. Um, and, uh, and they themselves are... Um, the the stories that um, become the Iliad and the Odyssey um, exist across Greece over a long period of time. There, there are lots of bits being composed orally, performed by rhapsodes, uh, people like David, basically, telling stories through song. Um, and the idea that the Iliad was ever performed as sort of a 24-book epic by a single performer is, is pretty unlikely, although possible. As I say, it's ancient history. You can't ever rule anything out. Um, and then a dog at him, oh, the, and so on. But um, so I wouldn't feel confident saying um, that this bit of Homer is early or that this bit is late. I think sometimes it's more tempting to say, oh, this seems to convey this, and therefore this must be late, and therefore it proves what I think about later. And it's, oh, <laughs> that's a risky bit of reasoning. Um, but what I would say, I guess, is that I completely agree, of course, that what you get, the Odyssey, let's go for as an example, because I always wang on about the Iliad and it'll make a nice mm -hmm. change. In the Odyssey, um, Penelope is one of the most opaque characters in all of literature, all of Greek literature, all of literature, full stop. When we first meet her, she is veiled. Um, and we're always trying to, that, that's not an accident. We're always trying to guess what this extremely enigmatic woman might be talking about. She cries very readily, but of course she freaking cries. Her husband has been away for 20 years, well, 19 years at the point of the start of the poem. She's brought up their child alone. She has more than 100 young men in her house trying to persuade her that she should remarry because her husband is dead, something which she doesn't want to accept, by the way. Her parents think that she should remarry. And so she's, she's of course, she's upset. She basically has PTSD, the entire poem. And then every now and then she'll make a statement or do and, and say, um, Athene will put the idea into her mind to say a thing. And she'll, so she'll come out and say it. And you go, well, but it, who, who, is that her or is that Athene? Who is this? Or she'll have a dream and the dream will have been implanted in her mind by a god or a goddess. 
And and this happens to the male characters just as much in, in Homeric epic. And you find yourself thinking, but who are you? Who are you? You know, when, when the gods can have this effect on you, when you're different to every single person you talk to, who are you? And of course, the idea of the inner voice could be a very perilous one. As Socrates found out to his cost, Socrates famously um, has a daimonion, a little daimon, um, uh, which speaks to him. And it's always uh, prohibitive. It never says, well done, Socrates. You've done tremendously well <laughs> with your excellent reasoning <laughs> and standing barefoot thinking. It only ever says, don't do that. Yeah, well, don't do that. Did, just uh, be kind to him. Why he, can't, he hasn't got a kind in voice. He's got a PG <laughs> in voice. And um, famously in his trial, um, he is uh, accused of uh, particularly of three things, of um, abandoning the old gods, blasphemy, asabea is the word in Greek, of introducing new gods and of corrupting the young. And that second charge, the third charge is the main one. And it's almost always a charge, by the way, levelled at men throughout history um, if they are surrounded by younger men. It's a charge which has been used to destroy gay men, uh, although Socrates' sexuality was much more um, fluid, let's say, than that. But it is a charge which is routinely used to destroy men who are attracted to men, I would point out. But the second charge is the relevant one here, and that's the introducing of new gods. And perhaps people thought his daimonion, his inner voice, um, was an attempt to actually um, subvert the notion of religion at the time and to have a whole new God. But it's true that the language of psychology just doesn't exist until later. So in, for example, plays like Euripides Hippolytus, the idea of desire is entirely external. Aphrodite walks on stage at the start and says, Hippolytus has behaved very badly to me, so I'm going to make Phaedra have a you know, ruinous passion for him, and that's too bad. The idea that desire might be internal is, is simply not present yet. It's an external force. You're struck by the arrow of, of Eros or uh, later of uh, Cupid. Um, or, you know, Aphrodite works against you. So it's absolutely true that gods in particular in, in Greek myth um, often fulfill a function that we would see as being psychological because the language doesn't exist and the idea of it doesn't exist until later. Well, we've got a question that kind of follows on. I should just kind of follows on. I should just quickly say as well, David, we will come to you with your show and tell as well, because uh, and we haven't done yours either, Natalie. But uh, uh, this is from Gail. Gail uh, wondered, uh, are there any gods who actually uh, gave gifts without a catch? Well, that is a good one. <laughs> I, that is really good. Um, gifts as opposed to just assistance. I mean, lots of gods give assistance. Um, so when Perseus uh, goes to uh, slaughter the ex in every regard, uh, shoddily, in my view, goes to slaughter uh, the Gorgon and bring back her head. He is given gifts. Yeah, men going on quests often get divine assistance. And he gets, I think he gets, does he get an invisible hat? I think from, from Hades, the hat isn't invisible, but it renders the wearer invisible, like the invis invisibility cloak in Harry Potter. Um, and he also gets a special backpack. Um, and the word in Greek is kibisi. Cabesis, I think. Um, and it's like you, if you're going to cut off the head of a gorgon, which has eyes which can turn you to stone, you need a special backpack to put it in because otherwise you could get turned to stone. And so he gets given a special backpack <laughs> by the gods <laughs> to do it as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I think sometimes you do get a present. It's hard to think. I mean, generally, when women get gifts from the gods, it's almost always uh, a compensation for having raped them. Um, so, for example, uh, you get the gift of prophecy or you get, you know, or, or uh, um, you get to have a child who will become a demigod. So um, Heracles, Hercules is a, is a case in point. So Zeus deceives Alcmena, um, the mother of Heracles, in order to, she, he pretends to be her husband, um, Amphitryo, disguises himself as her husband, Amphitryo. Um, and then her eternal super fecundation. Uh, precisely <laughs> and so your reward for that is that you get a demigod son but uh. another way of looking at it would be that man raped you so it's quite a yeah, yeah yes I, I even in books i own that have been written during my lifetime and not always even by men i'm afraid to say you can quite routinely read someone saying um you know often the 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 sexual intercourse between a, a mortal woman and a god you know, it's not necessarily what she wants, but it usually works out well for her. You go, mm, wait, what, 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 what? And it's like, it's, yes, it's, it's, shall we go with problematic and leave it there? <laughs> well, I was reading, sorry, Josie. I was just going to say, there's some difficult elements among, amongst that. Aren't there? Hmm. <laughs> yes. 
aren't there just? <laughs> see, see, I was reading about, I think it's a Norse god, a Norse dolphin god oh. uh, that would take human form to commit terrible acts, but had to wear a hat because the one thing that happened during human form was the blowhole didn't disappear. Oh, so nice. there we go. That's yeah. what I about that yesterday. The... Anyone wearing a hat should be treated with suspicion. Yes, always true. Always true. Well, yeah, it, I mean, you see? Very nice. Just but the, the Zeus, Zeus impregnating Danao, the mother of uh, Perseus, she's locked in a wooden case at the time. And it's like, it does, and I think he, he sort of reigns through the woodwork. And it's like, how is she sleeping? The impregnation happened. I can't even begin to do the, the geometry of this and nothing. But anyway, you just have to let it go sometimes. Frozen style. Um, we will try... We will try. We've, we've got two more questions, but to, because we're nearly out of time, I would. I, I, I sent you an email this morning saying show and tell. So, David, what is your show and tell today? Oh, I'll be quick. Um, let me just. Can you see that? Oh, yes. yes. Look at that. That's um, my friend Kenny, my dear friend Kenny. Um, he's an astrologer and a philosopher, and he's very good. And um, he makes totems for people. So this is my. This, this is basically my portrait. Wow. In tarot and astrology cards. And here, this is the genius of it. I did that um, single with Hi-Fi Sean called Transparent, actually a year ago, um, two years ago. And uh, this is the record. This is the Transparent 45 with my astrological chart behind it. And then he's put a robin here and a nightingale there. And then he's put Buddha, Jesus. This is a painting by a guy called Karma Funtsop that I spent, I, I paid a thousand pounds for and then left on a bus in Australia. <gasps> oh my goodness. Oh God. But then, <laughs> right in the bottom here. Pericles, look at that. Yeah, my favourite sculpture, I dare say. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's a beautiful thing. And you can have one if you want it. All you've got to do is send him your time of birth and uh, your um, date and your location. And he'll create something like that for you. I, I've got a question. I don't, I don't know, know what a philosopher is. Um, a, a, a person who reads tarot. Oh right, I didn't know that. That's a, that. I'd, I'd never heard that word before. I've got. A, I, I found. I think, it's probably, I think it's very possibly made up, but um, it's 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 out. It strips off the tongue. It's oh. not anymore. Now it's all words are made Rather up. Like Fine. Pomp and Demonion. Ah, <laughs> oh, this is. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, Josie. No, no, I want to know the story of the painting. I feel like someone in Australia has it on their wall now. And I feel like with the internet, everything is traceable and findable. You know, oh, I, I, um, I uh, left it on a bus on Christmas Eve. I think somebody got a very nice gift. <laughs> that is the terrible thing, isn't it? If you spend all your money on art and therefore always have to take the bus, the increased jeopardy in each <laughs> one of those number 36 rides home is I a very dangerous thing. I did apologise a few years later by buying this image of impermanence from the same artist. Oh, oh. nice choice. Yeah, but um, yeah, I was very sad to lose that one. I mean, actually, I've got, I, I did have the presence of mind to take a photograph of it, but if you look closely, can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So basically, it's Buddha and Jesus overlapping. But what's really odd is that either side of it, you get you, you get a living room, but um, you get the galaxy in Buddha's third eye. And then I said, their eyes are very different. And um, Karma, he came from Tibet. He came from Tibet to Australia in the nineteen seventies as an exile. And he said, um, that's because um, Jesus sees you, and Buddha sees everything. <laughs> Go that ahead. was the hardest homeschooling question yesterday. The Moses homework took way, Chip, trust me, to find that <laughs> RE was the hardest thing to do with my son. And, and it was one of the questions was how uh, Buddhism, Buddhism and, and the Moses story overlap philosophically. And I think they, uh, bi or, or biographically, I think they do. Philosophically, I was less certain. Anyway, I'll leave that for everyone at home. Uh, we've finished it now and we've had to hand it in, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Natalie, what, what, uh, what's your show? Oh, I have two things. The first is my edition of um, Ovid's Herodes, because as you know, Robin, I am doing a video each week of each poem. They are um, letters written by abandoned women of Greek myth to their menfolk, uh, some of whom have uh, left them behind, some of whom have have been delayed for other reasons and they're funny and ironic and sometimes angry and beautiful and uh at the very start of but just the week before lockdown uh, matilda who runs my social media 
um, said I needed something to do in case I, I ran out of things and got stressed. Um, and so what we decided on was that I would do one of these poems each week. So that will go up again. The fourth one will go up tomorrow, but they're all lurking around on um, social media. And the other one is my actual favourite object inspired by David that I own at all. And he is a tiny little votive ram. He's made of bronze and he's got beautiful, I don't know if you can see his lovely curly wool if I move my fingers yeah. out of the way. Um, but yeah, he would have been a votive offering um, to a temple and he's mine. He's How old? Mine. How old? Yeah. Um, he is the second century, I think. Second century. Yeah. Wow. So he's awfully old um, and I love him very much. That's beautiful. Um, we, 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 I think we've only got time. For one I think we've only got time for one more question. I'm sorry. There is a longer question about the Bible and uh, the use of Greek myths, and how, we'll we'll deal with that another day. Uh, this is. Uh, I'm not sure who this is. This is from. I think it's from Kate. Um, uh, I wonder if Natalie had any favourite adaptations of classical stories, time shifted into different scenarios in modern times. Things like Oh Brother, Where Art? You no, know, I do like Oh Brother, Where Art? Though, because as you know, I really like uh, alt country and. Um, and lots of country music in general. So yes, I did like Oh Brother Where Art There very much. I liked Zachary Mason's uh, Lost Books of the Odyssey um, a great deal. I didn't like his version of the Metamorphoses, but his Lost Books of the Odyssey I thought was wonderful. I love Disney Hercules. I fully appreciate that it abandons entirely the um, the narrative era. But I love the songs and I love the, I, the love story is beautiful. And I think it has lots of, of fun and joy of even it and also i like that it's danny devito being philoctetes and i like that he crosses the road going hey i'm walking here that's what i want and i like that james Woods is hades and i like that he goes is it out is my hair out uh, because his hair is always on fire i love disney hercules i'm generally quite grumpy about greek myth on film but disney hercules gets a buy from me brilliant brilliant Thank you so much, both of you. I hope you'll come back because there's a load more that we, well, huge amount that we haven't uh, uh, talked about today. Um, I'll just quickly I mention. To, I, I need to talk to Natalie, actually. <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we will leave you too. I feel to, like you uh, deserve right. uses on bars. Yeah. How can you not like them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so easily led. Thanks. I've really, really enjoyed today. It's been really stimulating mm -hmm. and made me think uh, in a really fun way. Thank you so much. Thank also, you. I'm really having... pleased because I'm always looking to make more space for books, space for and books, I'm... and I'm going to take those Robert Gray's books and uh, just pop them in the shed for when Oxfam's open again. So, uh, am I all right on book? Travelled. That's right, isn't it? Great. Robert Frost. Ah, oh, Frost. And Happy to Grace. help. I never know anything modern. <laughs> frost and Graves are both bleak <laughs> images. So the, the Graves and the Frost and the... Uh, um, are we all right in terms of Bullfinch's mythology books? Are they okay as just a general reference work, by the way, just oh, out of Robin, interest? I haven't no. seen them for 100 years, so I'm not sure, actually. I, I'll consult and check, but I don't have one to hand to check for you urgently, I'm afraid. Okay. I haven't read one for way too long. Um, so uh, just uh, as uh, as Natalie mentioned, you can keep up with lots of her work. Stand up for the classics is going to be out soon, and also oh uh, yes, it is that in May. I knew that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, the, on Radio Four. I knew that well. too. Wonder, wonderful books um i will mention that tomorrow we have uh, al kennedy on tomorrow yes. is literature and so we've got al kennedy who is just a quite wonderful author uh, in, incredible short stories wonderful novels uh and uh, and a very interesting book about bullfighting as well which is very very intriguing and we may well end up talking about that she's not pro she just became interested because she ended up suffering from a similar injury that bullfighters uh suffer from and uh, this led to her kind of exploring that idea and that was very very interesting and we also so have a jazz lesson tomorrow because we have an award-winning trombonist coming to us from new orleans who is haruka kikuchi who uh she is going to be uh well giving us some trombone work from her um backyard in new orleans wow so what I time is it in new orleans now Oh, you know, gonna wake up her neighbours. <laughs> um, and David as well. In fact, my next thing that I'm going to do the moment we stop doing this is read your article that is in uh, medium.com, uh, which is uh, connecting what's going on now, but also with ideas, uh, requiems, etc. So go and look at some of David's. Follow him on, on if you can, friend him on Facebook or, or, or go via Twitter. There's always interesting things that, he, that he's writing as well. And uh, follow his musical work. Go to our tip jar if Thank you. you Robin be bothered um and it's uh, as we said we're going to share going to try and make sure there's some support for a lot of the artists who are having problems now and also for the art centers as well uh, we've been able to contribute to some of the art centers in the last week we hope to be able to contribute again at the end of uh, next week as well 
So thanks very much. That was the end of the first day of uh, Shambles College. You can use this as an alibi. It really is homeschooling. It really does count. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you, David. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, you to now, Lucy. Well, um, I'm hiding in this room until Johnny takes Mrs. Baby out for her walk. <laughs> I, <laughs> then I have about an hour and a half with which to decide whether to prioritise chores, work, leisure or rest. Which to choose? So <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow uh, at 10am. Thank yeah. you, everyone. See you Thank soon. Thank you, Robin. Oh,